Really, really good to see you. Uh, if you are new here, uh, my name is Joel. I'm one of the leaders in the church. And um, every week we have teaching from the Bible. Uh, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to uh, skip the first 26 verses um, and refer to them next week. Uh, so I'm going to read verses 27 to 43. Good to be talking to you, especially if you're joining us on video at the race course or Hove or Shoreham. Uh, let's read verse 27. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals, harps and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the district surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netaphathites, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves. And they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate. And after them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah. And Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah and Jeremiah. And certain of the priest's sons with trumpets. Zechariah, the son of Jonathan son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zachur, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Ezrael, Milalai, Gilalai, Mai, Nethanel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. At the fountain gate they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David, at the ascent of the wall above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall and above the gate of Ephraim and by the gate of Yeshana and by the fish gate and the tower of Hananel and the tower of the hundred to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God. And I and half of the officials with me, and the priests, Eliakim, Marcia, Minamin, Micaiah, Elionai, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Marcia, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehonanan, Malkijah, Elam, and Ezer. And the singers sang with Jezariah as their leader, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Let's quickly pray together. Father, thank you for this book. And we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who this whole book points to. And we pray that you'd send your spirit now so that we would see more of Jesus and learn to love him and trust him more and serve him more faithfully. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if you're new here, we give you a bit of background to this. This is a story of a brave group of builders who had returned to their home city, the city of Jerusalem, which in a previous generation had been uh, basically demolished and they had been exiled, thrown out of their own city. And over a course of many years, gradually, these people had been moving back and trying to establish it as a community again. And in this story of Nehemiah, what we've been reading here as a church for the last few months, we've learned about a particular group of people led by a, a remarkable man called Nehemiah who, who got busy constructing the walls around the city and, uh, and starting to populate the city all over again. The walls were a very important part of what it, what it meant to be a city. They gave the city kind of prominence and dignity and security and status. Without the walls, the city was really a joke. And so Nehemiah took it on himself to get this thing done. And they went through trouble and opposition and hostility and mockery and death threats and all kinds of trouble before the walls were done, but by the time they finished, the, the city was up, the walls were up, and it, it looked good again. It was like, yes, we've, we've amazing, it's just amazing, we've finally got this thing constructed that looked so impossible 
only, only a few weeks, months ago, it looked like it would never happen. Look what has happened. And now we've got to the point where they're celebrating what's been uh, accomplished, and they're doing it by getting up onto the walls with these two big celebrations, choirs, which are going around the walls, encircling the walls, and uh, going in different directions. So they do a semicircle and meet at the end, just where the temple would have been, to, to, to have a great big worship time, big kind of celebration at the end. It's really, it's like a kind of housewarming. It's like we, we've, we've, we're in. Now let's, 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 let's get this thing warm. Let's get this thing like, feel like home to us. Let's celebrate. Let's kind of let our hair down and, and, and settle. It's a bit more than a housewarming because it, it's, well, if you look at the very first verse there, verse 27, it's, it uses that word dedication. The dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. It's, it's like they're kind of, they're consecrating it. Like, like uh, you might if you had a child and you, and you loved God and you believed in Jesus and you wanted to say, I want to raise this child to, to, to know God, to have the same faith that, that, that I have or my spouse has. And, and so you raise the child that way intentionally. You might have a dedication service. We, we sometimes have Thanksgiving services here at, at, at CCK as a way of saying very much that. It's like they're having that kind of a, an, a moment, but with a, a wall in mind, with a city in mind. We're dedicating the city. This is all about God. It happened because of God. It couldn't have happened without God. And now that it has happened, we're going to dedicate it to God. It's God's city. It's not ours. It's, it's, it's Jerusalem. It's the great city. It's the city. It's the holy city. And we've talked over the last few weeks about how immensely important to the people of God, the city of God was. And, and actually still is. I don't mean the physical city in, in the Middle East, although that's certainly worth praying for, but the new Jerusalem that God is building, that this ancient city is a kind of shadowy uh, kind of template for. God's constructing a global city, the new Jerusalem, the church of Jesus Christ. And Nehemiah in this story is, is, is saying, look, that's so important. I'm going to devote my life and energy and my passion and even suffer to see it built. And it's, it's happened. And so this is a huge, huge moment for them. And they celebrate. They worship and they praise God. Which gives us an opportunity today to learn a little bit about worship. And uh, this, just sort of look at the... The nature of what it is, what is it we do when we worship together? And so I want to look at that particularly from this, this part of the story. It's this, there's a lot of reasons why we should talk about this. One of them is that if, you, if you're a Christian, it's worth being reminded, freshly reminded. Why is it that we do this? Why do we sing for a start? Why do we, what is the point? You know, sometimes we just do things out of habit. It's good to remind ourselves occasionally, what, what's the habit for? What does it serve? What's the function? Are we just doing this because we can't give it up? It's just a habit? Or is there a reason for it? And so we can look at it from that point of view. But also, look at it from the point of view of someone who's, who's curious about Christianity, who, who's, who's interested in God and the Bible and coming to church. Maybe you're, you're, you're watching this in one of the, the other sites or you're, you're here today and you're thinking, I, I, I don't get the singing bit. I understand why you listen to teaching from the Bible. I understand why you maybe meet in small groups and discuss it. But why do you keep singing? And I don't understand why the singing can be quite emotive. You, you sing often with like your hands raised and you clap and some of you will, will start dancing and, and it can get emotional. It's intense. And what is that? Why, why are you so intense about it? And I've occasionally had this conversation with people who, who will say to me, you know, is that, is that put on? Are you getting intense because you're supposed to? Is it like at this point get intense? You know, that's the, there's a kind of a training thing that we don't tell anyone about where you, we come along and we teach you how to be intense. And, or is it just kind of osmosis? You just, you just pick up the vibe just by being around long enough. You start getting a bit intense and you don't really know why. You just, you just think, well, I've got to behave well. You know, that's what Christians do. They get emotional. Well... <sighs> If that is the reason why, then something's wrong, okay? So I, I'll allow for that. Sometimes people do get intense for the sake of being intense. That happens. But I would plead with you to remember that that's not just Christians that do that, okay? Everyone, everyone is susceptible to peer pressure. Everyone will, will fall into certain behaviors just because they're blending in. You don't have to be religious to do that. People will, will get intense for the sake of intensity in any kind of circumstance. But, but I'd also say to you, <laughs> You're missing it. 
Because the reason that people do express emotion in worship, the reason people become expressive at all, and we stand and sing, we take bread and wine, and we, we lift our voices, and you'll see people sometimes with tears, sometimes with radiant faces beaming with joy, sometimes just in sorrow, sometimes even after a meeting just sitting and just, just patiently waiting and sensing that God is near them, they don't want to get up and leave. Just, just what was that about? Well, I want you to understand, if this book is real, if this book is true, if, if, if it's telling a true story, then surely it's quite appropriate. Surely, surely we're talking about the most important thing of all. And all of us have got things in our lives that will, if touched, cause a reaction. Each of us have the most important things in our lives. We all have a, a precious thing, a thing that whether it's a, a, I don't know, a, a, a relationship or a few relationships or a thing that we like doing as a hobby, or I don't know what it is. There, there are... There are things that we, we cling to. Maybe it's just a sense of control. Maybe it's a need for comfort. Maybe it's a need for affirmation, for people to respect you and speak highly of you, for people to, to like you, for people to, to praise you, for you to be popular, for you to be good looking. You, you, you'll have something you're pursuing that's the kind of end goal of your life. And if that gets poked, well, well, we'll notice because there'll be some kind of reaction. There will be emotion involved. We, we are all intense. We're humans. We're all intense about something. We might hide it, but trust me, as a pastor, I see it. When, when you try and get into people's lives and deal with the real issues that are going on, you get reactions because people, people have deep motives and longings in their heart that they don't want to be distracted from. They don't want them to be disturbed. It's like... You know, the dentist just a, a few weeks ago, and I'm at the point where it's like my teeth are now um, need some attention. And uh, maybe some of you, you can relate to this. I've, I've always had disgraceful teeth, but it's like the, the dentists are now saying things like, okay, we're going to have to just take this one out. And I'm like, and replace it and do something. And he said, nah, nah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, but he's just like, he's like treating me like, you know, like an old car. You know, when you go to the guy and say, can you fix it? Can you say, well, we could. But um, not really much point, is there? Really, we might as well. So I'm like, that's how they talk about my mouth now. So, so he's he's poking around, he's trying to find out what's wrong, and he the way he does it. And if you're a dentist, you'll, you, you presumably this is normal. I hope it is. Otherwise, I've found the ye olde dentists of medieval Brighton, who, who basically he poked all my teeth and all my gums until until he got a reaction. And I was just trying to find out what's going on. Does this hurt? No. Does this one hurt? No. I'm being really nonchalant, you know, kind of, because nothing hurts me. Cause my, I've got it together. My life's fine. I'm, I'm sorted. I've got no issues. Does this hurt? Ah! Don't ever, ever touch that again. And, and you know, there's a part of your life that's like that. There's something that, that when a preacher or, or a well-meaning friend or a, or a small group leader takes you and just says, oh, can we just talk about this? And... And if they didn't know that there was an issue before they said it, they do now because, oh, they get a reaction. And, and we, we've got deeper motives, deeper th things that we're insecure about. Listen, when you see people expressing emotion to God, what it may be a sign of, and I hope it is usually in this church, is that the thing that they are most passionate about, ultimately, the inclination of their heart, in their heart of hearts, is knowing God. Is, is the God who they've got to know, this amazing person. He's completely turned their life upside down and they, 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 they are excited about him. They are stirred about him. They, they're drawn into fellowship with him. They, they, they found the, 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 what Jesus called the pearl of great price, the thing that makes it worth giving everything else up for. And until you've seen the pearl of great price, until you've seen truly Jesus and his kingdom and how good he is, well, you'll always have other things that will distract and, and, and draw and drive you. You'll always have your one ring, shall we say, you know, like in the, in the Tolkien book, you know, the, 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 the Gollum kind of obsession, my precious, my, the thing I must have. God's ambition for your life is that you should be weaned off <laughs> of whatever the precious is to, to find him 
the most precious of all. And when that happens, it, it transforms everything, it changes you. It's, it's what happened to these people. They are worshipping with great joy because it's like they've come back from their wandering. They've come back to the, the, the true God and their true identity and their, their true purpose in life, the thing that gives their life meaning. It's, ah, oh, we, found, we found out who we are. We found out we've become the city of God again. Look, the walls are up. We, we are the people of God. We are the city of God again. What a privilege. What a joy to be the people of God. But, let's just back up for a moment because it's worth noticing one more thing before we go further. Being the people of God is, is a huge privilege. But it's if, if this book is anything to go by, it's, it's also very tricky. It's complicated. Especially for these people at this time in history. What do I mean? Well, what is, what is going on in verse 30? It says just before they get into this kind of big party atmosphere, this, the festivities, the priests and the Levites purified themselves. And they purified the people and the gates. And the wall, what does that mean? How do you purify a wall? What, what, what on earth does that involve? Purify themselves, purify the people. Well, if, you, if you've read the, the first few books of the Bible, especially books like Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, some of Exodus, you, you'll, you'll know that for these people to have friendship with God, to be with God, was not uncomplicated. It required a certain degree of preparation, a serious amount of sacrifice, ritual, purification involving lots and lots of blood, lots and lots of, of carcasses, lots and lots of quite heavy stuff going on, things that they, they had to prepare, purification of garments, washings, cleansings, seasons of time, Times of rest, times of coming apart from the crowd. These priests, these people taken from one of the 12 tribes, the Levites, God said, right, this tribe, this tribe's not going to have any land. They're just going to be set apart to be priests. They're going to represent the rest of you by looking after the holiest places. And they're going to be the ones that will help you to connect with me because they'll be conducting all the purification routines. It's, it's heavy. You read Leviticus, it's heavy. It's not a pleasant, easy book to read. It's an important book to read, though, because it reminds you and me of just how different God is to us. And, and this is something that generally 21st century Brightonian people will usually miss. We, we tend to assume that if there is a God, if, uh, he or she or it will, will presumably be very happy to welcome us in because we're, we're kind of, you know, we're reasonable people. We're nice people, most of us, and, you know, we're kind of hip as well, and, you know, he, he should be quite pleased he's got us because, you know, well, who wouldn't? You know, we're, we're, good, we're all right. And we might have a nagging sense in our conscience that mm, maybe there's some things in my life that God wouldn't approve of. Maybe there are some things that, that I wouldn't approve, if I'm honest, things that I don't like other people doing, and I do them myself, and some of the thoughts I have. Some of the things I spend time thinking about or spend time looking at, things that I say, things that I do. I, okay, if I dwell on that, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable about knowing God because I think God is supposed to be pure or good or different than me. And I want to tell you, if, if, you, if you pay attention to that thought process, if you, if you start digging into that idea, you'll get closer to what the Bible actually has to say about you and about God. Because that the God that the Bible describes is, is so pure, so holy, that he's dangerous. Literally dangerous. I mean, some of the stories in the Old Testament still shock us. They, they ought to shock us. They, they wake us up. Because they, they show us, oh, you, you can't just get away. You can't just be nonchalant around him. He's, he's spotlessly pure. He's perfect in all he does. He's utterly different than me. And, and he's the God that I've, I've been welcomed into, the, the, the God who's invited me into friendship. How, how is this ever going to happen? And there are stories in this book of people who, 
I mean, one example will do. When the people of Israel receive the Ten Commandments on two stone tablets, Moses goes up the mountain, receives the Ten Commandments. This is Mount Sinai in the desert. It says, put a cord around the mountain, a big line around the mountain. If anybody goes beyond it except Moses, they'll have to die. If anyone goes beyond it. And I think, oh, that's terrible, that's horrible, it's wicked, that's, that's monstrous. You're getting some idea of just how dangerous. It, it's not actually terrible. The problem is us. The problem is that within us, there's this selfishness, this rejection of God, there's this estrangement, this enmity, even what the Bible calls hatred of God. Hatred of God. That's even in the, the, the child that's born the, in the womb. It, it, the Bible says it's right there in humanity, in the core of humanity. There's this distance from God, this wandering, this desire to be away, this difficulty. We don't like him. We're uncomfortable around him. And it's because of the guilt and the shame that's real. It's not just a feeling. It points to something real. The feeling points to a reality. There is such a thing as guilt. There is such a thing as shame. And God is saying, yeah, I, I want to gather you in. I want to befriend you. <laughs> he doesn't have to. Why should he? He's chosen to. He loves people. He wants to make friends. But how can he? And he's so shockingly pure. And we're so shockingly guilty. If we don't understand that, we'll have a lot of trouble understanding so much of this book. So these people, they, they're realizing that. They're going through the purification routine. And, and yet, it's a strange mixture, isn't it? Because there's this purification which reminds them of how God is holy. And yet there's this amazing sense of genuine pleasure, happiness, lightness even. You get to the end of the, the, the chapter or end of the story I read to you. And in verse 43, they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. God had made them rejoice with great joy. The word joy just keeps coming up. Women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Oh, my goodness. You get the idea. It's, it's just a delightful moment in their story, and yet it's mixed with this sense of fear. What's going on there? Well, here's the thing, and, and the reason I'm going on about it is because these people live in the, in the Old Testament. They live prior to the coming of Jesus. And the, the, the Christian message is referred to as the good news, the gospel. The gospel means good news. If Christianity doesn't come to you as good news, you haven't heard it properly. If when you hear Christianity you hear bad news, you haven't heard it. Because the Christian message is unspeakably good news. Because it's, it's, it's a story of how God said... I must find a way to welcome these children home. In spite of the shame, the sin, the rebellion, the stains of their guilt and all that they've done, I want them. I love them. I cherish them. I delight in them. How can I welcome them in? Even with the killing of animals, even with the blood on altars, even with all of the Levitical priesthood and even with all of the, all of the rituals and these, this whole system, only one person was ever really allowed to go in to the holiest place once a year. The high priest went in once a year. It wasn't going to work. <laughs> it wasn't going to work. It was a fearful thing to be the people of God. Wonderful but fearful. What did God do? God said, I will solve the problem. I will solve the problem of their guilt. I will solve the problem of their shame. I will solve the problem of their burden under laws that they don't keep, they can't keep, their hearts are far from me, I will become one of them. I will live perfectly amongst them. I will be the faithful, covenant-keeping Israelite, and I will take up upon myself all of the guilt and all of the shame. I will receive it in myself so that they, they can be set free from the burden, so that they can be welcomed in as children to a father, not cowering wretches, terrified of taking a single step further. But children at home with a father, ple pleased to embrace them, pleased to, to hold them, pleased to sit on the couch with them, as it were. You know, I have kids and, uh, you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a beautiful, affectionate privilege that children can have when they just sit on their dad's lap and know that they're so at home. It's about as 
home a place as a kid can be. Surely there's nowhere, <laughs> there should be nowhere where a child feels more at home. I know that's not always the case. But that's the way God wants fatherhood expressed because that's the kind of God he is. That you should feel so at home with him. What, with him? We, did you not say just a minute ago, the mountain, you cross the line, you die. Yeah, him. That one. How? How what, what shocking price was paid? What terrible sacrifice was necessary? What act of mercy was called into being? How did he do this? How did he make a way? If only we knew. We'll never know. We'll, we'll see scars on his hands, but we'll never really know what he suffered. He made purification for sins. And the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus did it all. He said on the cross, his last words from the cross, it is finished. Now, if that's true, it changes the whole atmosphere of worship. Because what worship becomes then is, is Rather than us trying very hard to approach God and hope that he's in a good mood, or, or trying to approach God and hope that we might have an audience with him, or trying to approach God and doing our best to impress him and perform and keep the rules well, or whatever it is that we do, or even trying to bring our sacrifice, our offering, our, you know, here's my lamb, here's my, here's, here's my pigeon, here's whatever, you know, the, the different creatures that the law coded, all these different ways that you could come and bring your offering... Why don't we do that today? Why don't we do it? Well, because Jesus has done it. And so you and I, we don't come in here to try and impress him. We never need to now. We come instead to celebrate and rejoice in what has been done. We come to worship God knowing he's, he's achieved all that's necessary and our relationship with him is now one of freedom, privilege. It's a relationship of sonship daughterhood it's it's fellowship with a, a father because of jesus and that being the case we we when we get to worshiping and, and this is very important because i find a, 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 a strange kind of pressure can mount up uh, when we start to draw near in worship whether it's on our own or, or, or in a gathering like this on a sunday the temptation in our mind is to try and impress him or, or to try and feel like we ought to be here. Is there any, you know, I don't think I've done very well this week. Am I allowed? What do I need to do? Do I, and maybe even to try and get to a feeling. You know, you, I don't know if, you know if you're like me. This is how I've often found it. I try and get to a feeling. As long as I get to that place where I really feel like I belong, then, then I know I belong. But if, if what I've been saying is true, Actually, I don't have to feel like I belong before I belong. <laughs> I just have to reckon on what's true. I can genuinely begin to enjoy what's real. And, and, and feelings will follow, for sure. But I'm not trying to achieve a feeling. I'm not trying to make something happen. I'm not trying to, oh, if I really worship, if I really, then I might really be happy. I might really belong with God. And Worship times can be intense for all the wrong reasons. We can be trying to work something up in ourselves. And we can even sing songs that don't always help. Now, I, I thank God that that's not true here. I think our, you know, we, our worship leaders are, are wise people. We choose them carefully. They're people who choose songs to help us reflect on the good news. We don't sing many bad news songs. The bad news ones are the ones that are all about us. The one's about how wonderful our love for God is. How great our love for God is. How devoted we are to him. And how we're going to do this for him. We're going to do that for him. And this week we're going to do much better than we did last week for him. And look at how impressive we are. And we write songs as Christians that really, if you think about it, the hero of the song is me. Surely the hero of the song should be him. If the hero of the song is me, then I don't want to sing that. I know too much about me. It's just unreality. And I've been in some meetings where every song has been a song about my love for God. I love you. I'm going to love you. I'll do this. It's, it's all statements of intent. By the end of it, you just feel exhausted. 
And I'm thinking, I don't even know the God who we're all claiming that we love very much. From this meeting, I've learned nothing about him. Nothing's been revealed to me about him. There's a place in the New Testament in 1 John where it puts it in beautiful phrase. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's love. And knowing and, and, and soaking and receiving and just meditating and enjoying <laughs> that reality. His abiding, complete, consistent, undeserved, freely given, agonized over at the cross, love. And if I truly dwell on it, if I, rec- if I know that, Oh, the love that I have for him will grow. It's, it, will, it will come. If I really do make it my intent to know his love, mine will follow. So we, we sing to rejoice in what God has done. And we'll sing songs. Sometimes some of them will be full of, of truth. Some of them will stretch your mind. We sing some songs that are really simple ones with about four words. And then we sing others with about 400 words. Because we want to stretch our mind with truth from the Bible that helps us to know him better. It's not a bad thing. It's a good exercise for you. The more you strain your mind to think through the wonders of what God has done for you in Christ, the more encouraged, strengthened you will be yourself. So it's good to process these things without feeling pressured. Sometimes in worship, we get, what, what's wrong with me? And I, I know what it's like. To go through meetings, we think, why am I the only one that's not elated here? Everyone else is, is, is clearly bubbling over with joy, and I'm not. And, and maybe if I just put it on, then I'll fit in more. That's not the answer. That's never the answer. Don't ape other people's external behavior. Internally, go back to what God has done for you in his son, Jesus. Internally, reflect on him. Internally, consider his blessings to you. Remember his mercies. Forget not his benefits. And you'll find you can't resist it in your heart. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All my inmost being, praise his name. And God has given us freedom then with worship. To enjoy free, truly to be free. Not to judge one another. Not to be looking, oh, is so and so sufficiently joyful this week? Is she sufficiently, are her hands raised high enough? Is he, yell, is he shouting? I'm not sure if he's, no, no, I don't. I don't. And we can be ever so, without realizing it, in the name of trying to be free, we're actually being legalistic and horrible, judgmental. It's totally inappropriate. But let me just say this as well, because I want to balance this. For some of you, you just need to know, when expressing our gladness, our gratitude to God, it's good to ask him and think, how does he want it expressed? You would do that, wouldn't you? I, I can think of times in my life I've, I've had uh, you know, people come around and do things for me in my house. Nearly everything that he's doing in my house, I have to ask someone to come and help me with, because I, I, I honestly don't. I can I can change light bulbs and not much more. And if 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 I've ever if anyone ever puts a shelf up, I'm staggered at the wisdom and skill and genius that they've. That is incredible to me. A shelf, a shelf. I look at them like they're Michelangelo, like it's the Sistine Chapel that they just a whole shelf. You did a shelf. And it's still there, seconds later. It's still there now. It's amazing to me. And then one, once a, a guy, a friend of ours, came around and did loads, lot, more than one shelf, a few shelves, in an alcove. He'd spent hours doing it really carefully because it was quite a tough request. We, he had to, it was an unusual position. It was, you know, had to really work at it. He was thinking about how to put the shelves in. We wanted floating shelves, you know, those ones that float. You know those ones? They, they, apparently. So he, he kind of he worked it out. He did the magic. And... Uh, we wanted to say thank you. And I said to his son, who's a friend, close friend, I said, how should I say thank you to him? Shall I, shall I uh, give him some money? He said, no, 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 no. That, that wouldn't be appreciated. I said, oh, okay. Shall I give him a card? He looked at me and said, a card? He's a bloke. What do you think? A card? So I thought, okay, okay. What else can I do? I said, what can I do? He said, well, why don't you invite him around for, for a meal? Okay. So we did that. Um, why am I telling that story? When, when God overwhelms you, 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 you might think, well, I, I'm so grateful. How do I express my gratitude? And the Bible does give us a few clues. It says right here, they, 
They sang. They had instruments. They made a lot of noise. It's not inappropriate. Some of us people think, well, I, I like to worship God in my own way, actually. I don't think singing is, I think that's, some people like to sing. I like to, just, I like to just quietly reflect while others sing. I like to listen to the singing because that's my way. God sees my heart. He understands what's going on inside me. Yeah, but the thing is, God actually says sing. And the, the thing, he doesn't say singing because he's like needy. Oh God, if only they sang. They didn't sing. Oh no, my whole week's ruined. They didn't sing. He's not desperate for your, right, he doesn't need you to sing. And actually, probably it's more like he's very gracious in putting up with some of our singing. But, but. He, he's not saying sing because he's needy. He's saying sing because it's good for you. What you sing kind of has a way of getting into your heart, doesn't it? Has a way of, I mean, you know, you know what I mean. I, I can't remember whole chunks of this book that I've tried to memorize. I can remember radio jingles from when I was eight. Awful ones. I can't get them out of my head. Because tunes and words go together to get something into you. You sing and you, you sing over the things of the Bible. You sing truths out. and they, they, get in, they have a way of bedding themselves down deep in your soul. It's good for us to sing. Learn to sing out the things of God. It requires more than just our mental faculties. It requires our vocal cords, our lungs, even our hands raised and clapped. It's like we're saying, I express myself physically to you because you made me more than a brain in a vat. You made me a human being. So I'm going to be a human being in my expression of worship. It's highly appropriate and it's good for you. And then finally, I just, just want to say it because it's right there. The joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. See that? Far away. What's going on? Why does he mention that? Nehemiah even wants them on the walls. It's like he's saying, okay, let's sing on the walls. On the walls, guys, I want people to see I want the cities, I want the people around who thought that, you remember what they said a few pages before, a few weeks ago, if, if a fox walks on that wall, it will fall down. Now look what God's done. Now let's stand and worship publicly. Let's show the world our God. See, worship, gathered, corporate, Sunday worship is also a mission. It's an opportunity to show the world something. When we sing and when we, we worship God together in, in, in this site, in the race course, in the villas, in Shoreham or wherever it is that we worship, we, we are providing an amazing opportunity for people who, like it says here, people who are far away. Now people in Brighton are not necessarily far away physically, but they are spiritually far away. Maybe you are here today, you're watching this and you're feeling far away. What we want for you to see as we stand in a moment and take bread and wine and as we worship God, we want you to see, because you're with us, we want you to see how good God is. We want you to understand when we worship, we're, we're proud of him. He's worth singing about. He's worth clapping and raising our hands and doing whatever. He's worth it. He's won our hearts. He's amazed us. We're staggered by him. And, and so when we show our satisfaction in God to the world we're giving them an opportunity to see him I, I used to think when I was you know I guess about 17 18 at college trying to help my friends to find Jesus telling my friends about Jesus I used to think to myself the last thing I want to do is bring them to church I'll tell them about Jesus that's what I do I don't want to bring them on a Sunday that will freak them out that's just too that'll be too weird for them I, thought, I look at this book, I think that's so the wrong way around. I want them to see the church, I want them to see the worship, to see us expressing our love for God. It's not private. In fact, there's places in the Bible where it talks about the, the, the guests being amongst you and saying, surely God is in this place, falling on their face and worshipping him. And we pray for that all the time. I pray every single week. I pray pretty much every day. <laughs> That, that, that people will come to our meetings in all the different sites, all the different services, and because they see God, and then this happens. I get letters, I get emails, they're my favorite ones, from people who are just new. People who say, I came to the meeting, and I didn't know what to expect, I was a bit nervous, and a bit, it was a bit weird, but when they started singing, it was when they started, I just found I couldn't stop crying. 
I just felt like it's real. It's true. It's, what's going on? They write these letters to me. I'm thinking, wow, it's breathtaking. Because what they're, they're seeing what we know. They're, they're understanding because they're amongst us. The goodness of God. Greatness of God. So when we worship, we, we are doing it for the city to see. We're not hiding in a corner. We're public. We're opening front doors all over the place saying, come, come and join us. Come and find out for yourself how good God is, how good he is. He sent his son. He loves you. He wants you to know him. Maybe you're not yet a Christian. and You never even thought that by coming to church today your life might get changed. But perhaps that's what's going to happen today. You come here just to check it out. Maybe today's the day when God is going to meet with you and speak to you and show you what he's like.